Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. Today we'll be looking at our last set of notes over Chapter 6. Uh, dealing with the last few sections of Chapter 6, we're really looking at electron configurations, how to do them, and some exceptions in electron configurations. Now, a lot of this you're going to recall from last year. So the good news is um, a lot of this is a review of stuff we talked about in pre-AP, which will make this section a little bit easier than the quantum number section from uh, that we looked at in notes yesterday. Now, electron configurations tell us how the electrons are distributed among the various orbitals in an atom. The most stable configuration or ground state is that in which the electrons are at the lowest possible energy state. We call that the off-bow principle. Lowest energy is off-bow. And you should remember this from last year. And this goes back to the picture we looked at yesterday, where if you had one electron, that 1s and 2s and the third energy level, they're degenerate. So your s's and your 3p's are all at the same energy. And when you get to the third level, your S's, your P's, and your D's are all the same energy. But as soon as you get a second electron in an atom, then the energy sublevels are no longer degenerate. So the entire third energy level, no longer at the same energy. Well, well, we'll look at today ways to remember, you know, what comes next. After the 1S, if that's your lowest, and you have to go to the next lowest next by um, the most stable configuration idea is your lowest energy configuration, which we call off bow. How is it you know what comes next? We'll be looking at reviewing that from what we talked about last year. Now, when writing ground state electron configurations, and you always assume it is a ground state configuration unless it says something different. So if it talks about excited state, then you no longer look at exactly what we're looking at here because electrons have jumped up to higher energy sublevels. Now, electrons fill in orbitals of increasing energy with no more than two electrons per orbital. That's the off bow. Lowest energy actually maximizes our attraction and minimizes our repulsions. And that's really what reality is all about with charged particles. You are most stable when you've maximized attractions and minimized repulsions. So really, when we talk about increasing energy, off bow lowest energy to highest energy, what we're really looking at is maximizing attractions and minimizing repulsions. The order in which we look at, we will do that. Next thing. No two electrons can fill one orbital with the same spin. That's Pauli exclusion. So when we're looking at two electrons in one orbital, one has to be a positive spin, the other has to be a negative spin. So first we fill by off bow, second we fill by Pauli exclusion principle. Now the third one, this is one sometimes people struggle with last year, but hopefully you got to the point where it made sense. So it makes it a lot easier to look at what we're talking about this year. For degenerate orbitals, that's talking about our equal energy level third level P's, or second level P's, or fourth level F's, or third level D's. When we have a sublevel, a bunch of electron orbitals all at the same energy level, they are degenerate for each other. So when we're looking at a sublevel, our 2S sublevel or our 3S sublevel, well, there's only one, so we don't really worry about it. But when we get into our 2P's, and our 3P's and 3D's, and our 4P's and 4D's and 4F's, those are degenerate orbitals. We've got more than one orbital at the exact same energy. Hund's rule says we have to put one electron in each orbital before any orbital gets a second. Why? Because it minimizes repulsions. The second you put a second electron in the same orbital, you're increasing the repulsions between those two electrons because you're trying to make two electrons live in the same region of space. So the second electron in can only get, be put in an orbital once all of the energy orbitals on that sublevel have one electron in it. That's called Hund's rule. We'll look more at that in a second. So really, when we're doing electron configurations, these are our three guiding principles. Off bow, Hund's rule, and Pauli exclusion principle. Those are how we add. Now, how do we show spin? I looked at this yesterday. You probably remember this from last year. One of the most common ways to do this is with up and down arrows. The first one in we'll always call our up spin. That's our positive one half. So this electron is our positive one half m sub s. And this electron is our negative one half m sub s. And the first one in is always our up. So this arrow right here would represent our positive one half m sub s value. Now, since it's on the second energy level, it would have an n equals zero. It's in an s, so it would have an oops step ahead of myself there, it would have an L equal to zero. And it's M sub L, which orientation? Well, there's only one orientation for an S, so that's our zero orientation. And since it's the first one, it would be M sub S of positive one half. So 
this electron would be a oops I'm slow down when I'm thinking through those an n of 2 an l of 0 an m sub l of 0 and an m sub s of positive 1 half and that's really what this picture right here shows so these four quantum numbers that are shown up here are all really in this picture for this electron configuration that you're showing. Now, if you recall from last year, the easiest way to get your electron configurations by off-bow is to organize your periodic table as is shown. So you've got your S block, your P block, your D block, and your F block. And remember, we're going to take helium and stick it over there in our S block so that for electron configurations, we've got it in the right place. And now in this way, if you follow through the atomic numbers, you can see what comes next. So once it's set up in this way, if we're looking at the 26th electron in any atom, so the last electron in iron would be the 26th electron, where are those 26 electrons at? Well, electrons 1 and 2 are filling the 1s. Electrons 2 and 3 are filling the 2s. Electrons 5 through 10 are filling the 2p. Electrons 11 and 12 are going in the 3s. Electrons 13 through 18, so notice all I'm doing is following through atomic number, would fill our 3p. Now 19 is right here, so 19 and 20 would fill our 4s. And then electrons 21 through 26 are going to be in our third level d. So all you have to remember is SPDF 1, 2, 3, and 4. Remember the first time you see the S is the first, first time you see a P is the second, first time you see a D is the third, and the first time you see an F is the fourth. Once you've set up your periodic table into these four blocks, you can figure out where the electrons are at in any atom by following off files. So what this really does is show us what's our next lowest. After the 4S comes the 3D sublevel. After we fill the entire 3D sublevel, next we're at 31. Well, that's going to be in the fourth level P. So once we fill our fourth level P, next we're on electron number 37. That's going to be in the 5S and so on. Remember, one thing about the off ball chart is there's the goofy F. Remember, 46, or I should say 56, and then 57. So after we fill our 6S, then we come down and fill our 4F. And then after we filled our 4F, then we come back up. And 71 is right here. So now we're filling our fifth level Ds. So it goes 6S, 4F, and then 5D. And that's exactly what off bow shows. So set up this way, your periodic table shows exactly what comes next. So this is the easy way. If you want, like you did last year, set up a block off a periodic table so it's easy to see. But hopefully it gets to the point where you can do it without seeing the numbers and letters there. Now... Hun's rule, when you're putting electrons into these orbitals, remember Hun's rule says each orbital on a sublevel, so when you have the two Ps, they're all at the same energy, the two Ps are degenerate with each, other level, with each other, they're all at the same level, you have to put one electron in each before any orbital gets two. So as we fill up, we would put our first one here, our second one there, our third one there, and the fourth electron would then finally come in and fill that. So that's fundamentally what Hund's rule is. When you're putting electrons in an equal energy sublevel, you have to put one in each. Now let me get rid of all of my garbage I wrote on here. Fundamentally what we're looking at with Hund's rule is, if we're looking at electron number seven, that's going to be in the second level P, the first electron will go into our first p orbital. So that would go into the first p orbital. So if we've got our second level p's, and there are three of them, the first electron in would go here, which is the fifth electron, will go in the first one. The sixth electron, the one that's in carbon, would go in the second 2p orbital. The third electron in, the seventh one in nitrogen or any atom, would go in the last 2 p so each of these must get one before any of them get two. That's what Hund's rule is. And then the eighth electron in any atom would end up going in the first one here. The ninth would go there, and the tenth would go there. 
That's Hun's rule. And it also worked for the Ds. Remember, there's one, two, three, four, five on a D sub level. So electron 21 is going there. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. So Hun's rule works for P's, D's, and F's. So for generative orbitals, the lowest energy is attained when the number of electrons with the same spin is maximized, which basically means if you try and put a second electron in an orbital, it's going to be higher in energy level because you have two things repelling each other. So you put one in each before any get two. That minimizes electron repulsion and lowers potential energy and more stability. So thus electrons fill each orbital singly with their spins parallel before any orbital gets a second electron. By placing electrons in different orbitals, electron-electron repulsions are minimized. And that's what stability is all about, is maximizing attractions and minimizing repulsions. So each box in a diagram represents an orbital. Half arrows represent the electrons. I usually draw them with full arrows. It doesn't really matter. The direction of the arrow represents then the relative spin. So if we've got lithium, it's got three electrons. You've got two electrons in the 1s and one electron in the 2s. And up arrow, down arrow shows spin. So this would be what we call an orbital diagram for lithium because it shows every electron and it really shows all four quantum number. You've got energy level, you've got sublevel, you have orientation, and you have spin. So it includes all the information in an orbital diagram. Now, both of these, by the way, let me jump back real quick here. Both of these are different forms of an orbital diagram. So both of these would work. I've also seen people use circles and then they put one versus two. The only thing that I don't like about the circle method is it's harder to show spin. Makes more sense, positive one half, negative one half, up arrow, down arrow. But either of these would be a valid way to do electron configuration or to do orbital diagrams. This is just the quicker way to do it than drawing all the boxes. Now, this basically, the picture we're looking at over here shows the distribution of all the electrons in an atom. When we're drawing an electron configuration, it's really telling us where all the electrons are inside an atom. Each component consists of basically a number denoting the energy level, a letter denoting, uh, showing the shape, which would be the second quantum number, and then a superscript denoting the number of electrons in an orbital. So the orbital diagram shows everything. The electron configuration notation is an abbreviated form of what we were looking at before. Instead of doing, you know, 1s with an up and down arrow and 2s with an up arrow for lithium, you'd write lithium is 1s with two electrons in it, and the 2s sublevel only had one electron in it, so it would be 1s2, 2s1. Now you need to put that one there. You can't just say nothing is understood to be one, because if you don't put anything, that means the 2s is empty. So lithium would be 1s2. 2s2. Remember, the number represents the energy level, the letter represents the shape, and the exponent represents the superscript position, represents the number of electrons in that whole sublevel. So you lose information about quantum number with the electron configuration notation. You no longer show spin, and you no longer show orientation, but you still show all the levels and sublevels that have electrons in them. Now, each sublevel with an electron is described with the number of electrons in the sublevel as a superscript. So something like carbon, which has a total of six electrons, two in the first 1s, two in the second level 2s, and then by Hund's rule, on the second level 2ps, the first two orbitals have an electron in it. So that would be written in electron configuration notation, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. It's quicker to do but shows less information, so we sacrifice a little bit of information. Now, the third type of configuration is sometimes called the condensed or noble gas configuration or shorthand configuration. All those basically mean is we're using a condensed form of the electron configuration. You basically try and show all the same information you showed before, but you want to try and get rid of electrons that aren't all that important. Well, if you go back to the last time you had a full S or a P, you can basically ignore all those electrons by describing what the noble gas is. So lead is a mouthful. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p6, 6s2, 4f14, 5d10, 6p2. That's the electron configuration for lead. Well, xenon is this stuff that I have here in the box. Well, 
Xenon basically was the last time we had a full S and P. So those are all going to be inner level. My highest energy level in S or in lead is the sixth energy level. You can see I have some six level S's and some six level P electrons. Well, if I go back to my last noble gas, I'm guaranteed to be describing electrons that are not on the sixth energy level, fifth and below. So that's why we use the noble gas configuration is we can guarantee <coughs> that we're not missing any electrons in our highest energy level. So instead of doing all that garbage, we just say xenon in brackets. That means all the electrons in xenon, 6s2, 4f14, 5d10, 6p2. Now, one thing I want to mention here, because you'll see it this way in some books. I prefer it listed that way, so you can see kind of what comes next and see it as it fills. But it's common for books to often show them in N order. So first you would show the fourth level, then you would show the fifth level, and then you would finish with what's on the highest energy level, which in this case would be 6s2, 6p2. These two mean the exact same thing. Either one are perfectly fine. I just prefer using this notation because it's a little more descriptive by off by what comes next, and it's easier to write using the table. But a lot of times you'll see books using this type of notation. They're both perfectly fine. They both mean the same thing. The one nice thing about this one is it's got the sixes together. So you can clearly see on its highest energy level, which is the six, this one has four electrons. So lead's got four electrons at its highest energy level, which is the six. That's the one nice thing about that notation. Now, when we're looking at the periodic table, the periodic table is organized because of electrons. And we're filling energy or, or uh, electrons in increasing order of energy. And the different blocks really represent different orbital shapes that we're in. The S block, the P block, the D block, and the F block. And the number of atoms across a block is related to the number of electrons it would take to fill that sublevel. It takes 10 electrons to fill the D sublevel because there's five Ds on any sublevel that has Ds, so it's 10 across. So the periodic table is really organized based upon the blocks of electrons, S, P, D, F, and how they fill. Now, the period number is actually the value of N. So we've got seven periods on the periodic table. If you know what your N value is, you know what period of the periodic table you're in. So remember, N actually represents the periods. And the different blocks, remember the shade in different colors, correspond to the different types of orbitals. S and P block make up the representative elements. And D is our transition, and F would be our inner transition. So S and P blocks are collectively what are known as our representative elements. They represent the full behavior, you know, one electron on the outside up to eight electrons on the outside, and all of the different chemical and physical properties that would be associated with one through eight. That's why they are called representative elements. They represent the full spectrum of chemical behavior. Now, one last thing before we finish this out. There are a few exceptions to um, off-bow that you really should know and have an understanding of. We don't get heavily into this. We don't worry about the Fs that are all goofy and so on. But there are a few situations that I want you to understand why the electron configuration is different than it's supposed to be. And you need to know these for the test. So some electron uh, configurations appear to violate the rules that we've discussed. And the reason is it's all about energy. Remember, our guiding principle is stability is about minimizing repulsions and being lower in potential energy. When you minimize propul repulsions, you're at lower energy. And anytime you're at lower energy, you are more stable. So what we're looking at with the rules were general guidelines about stability. But there are some situations, because of how the S's and P's differentiate, as you pick up electrons and they're no longer degenerate, so your P's and your D's and your F's are at slightly different energy amounts, and how those relate to your other S's, P's, D's, and F's really leads to some anomalies on the periodic table. But what it really comes down to is minimizing repulsions and lowering potential energy is going to be more stable. And there's a few situations where you can clearly see this in action. For instance, the electron configuration for chromium is argon 4s1 3d5, when it's clearly a 4s2 3d4 type situation. So how come we don't write it as 4s2 3d4? Why is it? that we know it's 4s1 3d5 based upon experimental evidence. So crypt or chromium looks like it's an exception to what we talked about with the rules before, and it is. But remember, exceptions have to happen for a very specific reason. It's got to be about minimizing electron repulsions and getting lower potential energy. So rather than the expected 4s2 3d4, that's exactly what it is. Well, think about what it did and why that might happen. 
when you go from two electrons in the 4s and in our 3d you had four when you went from this situation to this situation one here and one in each of those what's different between the top and the bottom in terms of energy well in the top you have a paired set you have one set of paired electrons remember the second electron in is always going to be higher in energy because of electron repulsions if we take that 4s electron and move it to the empty 3d we end up with minimized electron repulsions so chromium and molybdenum follow this anomaly because they're both doing the same thing the s and d sublevels are close in energy so it's not a big energy move and the minimizing of electron pulsions that we get so the energy savings we get by minimizing repulsions is greater than the energy spent to move that electron up from the 4s to the 3d or in the case of molybdenum from the 5s to the 4d so the gain in energy we get here is more than the energy that we basically spend moving up and remember the 3d is actually closer to the nucleus than the 4s is anyway and closer to the nucleus is lower in potential energy so really it's about what's happening we're minimizing electron repulsions and we're moving to a sublevel that's actually closer to the nucleus so by those two ideas minimizing electron propulsions and lower potential energy the lower we are in um, quantum number three versus four the closer we are to the nucleus and the more stable we are now another thing that we'll do this is that last set copper silver and gold down there and it looks like it's the same reason but it's not exactly the same reason copper is actually 4s1 3d10 rather than 4s2 3d9 so it looks like it's done the same thing you've promoted a 4s to a higher level 3d but now the difference we're looking at here it's not quite the exact same situation before when we moved out of the 4s it basically was a energy savings because we've minimized um, our repulsions and we move closer to the nucleus which was lower in energy anyway so when you look at the total net savings you basically save more energy when you move the 4s up to the 3d um, then you spent moving it so it's a lower potential energy and more stable well a similar but slightly different thing here is happening with copper so what's really going on with copper silver and gold well there's no electron to electron repulsion advantage um, because we're taking the 4s and putting it in the 3d9 so we had a pair of electrons in the 4s and we're going to make up a pair of electrons when we make it 3d10 so we haven't really gotten an electron to electron repulsion advantage but the s and d sublevels are close enough in energy that moving the electron closer to the nucleus is lower overall in potential energy and therefore it's more stable so what happens is by promoting that electron from the 4s to the 3d the electron is closer to the nucleus in a lower potential energy situation and that's more stable so keep in mind chromium and molybdenum are exceptions to the octet rule and then copper silver and gold are as well similar but slightly different ideas about what's going on there are other anomalies in the periodic table especially when we get into f block and they're all about the same thing minimizing electron electron repulsions and moving closer to the nucleus potentially to get lower, more poten uh, lower potential energy but it starts to get too complicated to really worry about after that so these are the only anomalies that you really need to know and understand for the test so what's happening in these two situations are similar but different so the one we just looked at occurs because the 4s and 3d orbitals are very close in energy that really is true in both cases so when we jump from the 4s to the 3d here it wasn't a big jump and the energy savings by not having the electron electron repulsion made a difference well similar type thing happens here these are also very very close in energy in fact they're even closer than the other situation so what it comes down to is precisely half filled and filled 3c sublevels end up more stable do not use this as an explanation on the ap test as to why an anomaly happens while it's a true statement it's not an explanation of why the reason why is you're minimizing electron to electron repulsions and the 4s and the 3d are very very close in energy remember 3d is actually closer to the nucleus which is lower in potential energy so 
those are the reasons why. Minimizing electron to electron repulsion and the 4S and 3D being uh, close in energy and the 3D being lower and closer to the nucleus. That's why. But it does end up being that half-filled and filled sublevels are more stable. And that's why and that's you know the reason why those things disappear. Last thing I want to mention about electron configurations is when you're dealing with electron configurations of ions. If you have sodium, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Now remember, when you remove an electron, you're going to remove an outer level electron. Well, in the case of sodium, this is the highest energy level. So when you remove the one electron from sodium, this electron is gone. So remember, you remove electrons from the highest energy level first, the outside energy level. So Na+, plus, which would have one less electron, would have this electron configuration. If you have something like tin, now we're talking about a large atom, so notice we're using the noble gas configuration. Well, these are the electrons on the highest energy level. So Sn4 plus is going to lose those four. Remember, you pull from the highest energy level first, and what's left is what's left. So Sn2 plus, if that's what we had, would remove these two, because those would be our highest energy, highest energy level and highest energy sublevel. So you would lose from there first. So if you had Sn2+, plus, you would have this electron configuration. So when you remove electrons and ions, remember you're removing them from the highest energy level first, the ones farthest from the nucleus. Now, for transition metals, first remove the highest P and then S, which is what we looked at in the last one. So this is iron. Iron can have multiple charge states, 2+, plus or 3+. Plus. So if you have the 2+, plus variety, you're going to take from here first, so you'd end up with 3D6 left over. If you have the 3 plus variety, then next you're removing from that D, and the 6 is going to become a 5. So keep in mind, if you've got a transition metal, sometimes they have multiple charge states. The first one is going to be removing the outer level, and the second one would you'd keep removing from what's left. So remember something like copper was an exception to the octet rule. So if you look at copper on the periodic table, so grab your periodic table so you can see this. Going back, the last noble gas would be argon, and copper was supposed to be 4s2, 3d4, but it's really 4s1, 3d5. So copper plus 1 is going to be argon. First remove the 4s, so it would be, oops, I wrote that wrong, 3d5. So it would become argon 3D5. And then if we had the copper 2 plus, it would be argon 3D4. So similar idea to normal ions, but with transition, you've got more things going on. Remember, pull from the P first and then from the S. Now, last thing I want to mention, because it's related ideas. Your book doesn't mention this here, but it's really related to concepts from this chapter. And there are ideas that come up that you should know for the AP test. So we can't just ignore them. So the very last idea I really want to look at from this chapter is atoms that are weakly elect, uh, attracted to magnetic fields. There are some atoms, and we're not talking about magnetism here. That's a different idea. We're looking at a very weak attraction that some atoms have for an electrical field. What's really happening are two concepts here, diamagnetic and paramagnetic. Electrons are all paired, so the substance is not attracted to electronic or attracted to a magnetic field. So diamagnetic is when you look at the electron configuration, or even better yet, the orbital diagram, and you'd see every orbital that has electrons, the electrons are paired. So this is a situation where it's not attracted to a magnetic field that's diamagnetic. Some other substances, oxygen being one, are actually paramagnetic. If you look at oxygen, it's got electrons in the 1s, and it's got electrons in the 2s, and then in its three 2Ps, what it looks like, oxygen, when you look at it on the periodic table, has eight electrons. So we're taking care of four, five, six, six, seven. Our eighth electron would go there. You'll notice in oxygen that you have two P orbitals with singleton electrons. So that makes oxygen a paramagnetic substance. And because it has two unpaired electrons, it's going to be more paramagnetic than something that only has one unshared pair of electrons. 
So because we're talking about electron configurations and orbital diagrams, and this is an idea that's directly related to them, even though this doesn't come up in this exact chapter in the book, now is when it's easiest to understand the concept of paramagnetism. If you have unpaired electrons in orbitals, you are paramagnetic. The more unpaired electrons you have, the more paramagnetic you are. And if you have no unpaired electrons, then you are diamagnetic. And that's basically explaining a characteristic property of some substances. How come some things are weakly attracted to electric or to magnetic fields and some things aren't? It's about whether you have unpaired electrons in orbitals. So something like carbon, is it paramagnetic? Well, that's what we just looked at. Remember that's, uh, well, we actually looked at oxygen a second ago. So in carbon, you have two unpaired electrons. So yes, it is going to be paramagnetic. In fact, it's got two unpaired electrons just like oxygen does. So it's going to have similar paramagnetism that, than oxygen does, or two oxygen. And that ends our last set of notes over chapter 6.